Welcome to our service this afternoon. And I just wanted to remind you that if you have some hymn requests or if you have prayer requests that you can call at church office and we will incorporate them as, uh, as much as possible. I'm going to do a little variety tonight, uh, this afternoon, as we uh, do our song sets. Uh, the first song sets, I'm going to read some scripture, and then we're going to sing a song that's related to that scripture. The first scripture comes from Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and it says, Therefore God exalted him, being Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our hymn is number 115, Fairest Lord Jesus. Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and Still the woodlands robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels ever can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise and Oration now and forevermore be thine. Our next passage comes from John twenty, fifteen through eighteen. Woman, Jesus said, Why are you crying? Who it is that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not continue to hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them all these things that he had said. Our hymn is a very familiar one, number 242 in the garden. I come to the garden alone when the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear 
Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me is falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. What an invitation you've given to us. It's remarkable that we who are dust and vapor may come into the presence of the Almighty. You know us better than we know ourselves, and for this we're thankful. We ask, O oh Lord, that though we be scattered in many places and in many, in many uh, situations, that you will bind us together. You are here, and we welcome you by your Spirit, Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If there are others with you, please greet them. Several years ago, our congregation pursued a Bible study course called Bethel Bible. And in this course, there were pictures that reminded people of certain concepts in the Bible uh, as a way to just uh, remember how the Bible fit together. The first picture was one of creation, where things were beautiful and God was giving dominion over everything to mankind. The second picture was one of harmony, and there was this hand reaching down with a musical note to a man in a beautiful garden. Everything was green and lush. There was another person in this picture, and they were in close communion with each other. There was, there was harmony with, with mankind and God, with each other, with nature, and even with self. However, picture number three was a different story. Mankind decided to rebel, and the picture in the background was all burned and ashes. The green was gone. The rivers were dried up. This beautiful note that had been given to God, from God to mankind, one of harmony, was now broken. And the second person in the picture was running in fear. The note had pierced the person to show that he was at enmity and estrangement from God, from nature, from others, and even himself. We can see in this time of the coronavirus situation that we are live in a broken world. Something so small able to bring an entire nation, more than one nation, to its knees. Instead of only praying for this virus to stop, I think it's important for us to take time to ask God to teach us what we need to know. So I invite you to come with me to God's throne. 
As a guide for prayer tonight, I'm going to use a, a prayer from David that I have used in the past, but it's a wonderful prayer found in 1 Chronicles 29. I will read a verse or two, and then I will expand with some other additional petitions. So we begin praying and reading 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the, of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Heavenly Father, you indeed are everlasting. You have no beginning and no end. Of course, this defies our minds and our understandings. We cannot comprehend such a being as you. But indeed, we thank you for who you are, that you are indeed beyond our limited understanding. We humbly accept the truth that you are not like us. Verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven, in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Indeed, Heavenly Father, all things are yours. Even in this season of crisis and lockdown, you have the greatness, the power, the majesty, the splendor, and you continue to be exalted over all. Words fail as we try to describe you and to think that because of Jesus, we may call you Father, loving Heavenly Father. Verse 12. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Again, we, we declare that all things belong to you, great and small. You made it all. You purposed it all. You sustain it all, even when it seems that things are falling apart or that there is chaos. How we need you to impress your presence on us in this time. We have little power over such powerful enemies of body and life. Teach us what we should learn from this crisis, even though our first prayer is to have it gone and gone forever. Verse 13. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. We indeed give you thanks. Words seem so inadequate and feeble. We would ask you, Holy Spirit, to make our lives show the deep gratitude we owe to our loving Heavenly Father. Verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. To be sure, who are we that you should care or give us attention? There is nothing in us which can commend you to us. No, there's nothing in us that commends us to you. Your action to reach us is based solely on your sovereign and undeserved grace. We lift up to you those who have been affected by this contagion, those who have been sickened by it, their families, businesses that have been disrupted, healthcare workers that fearlessly continue to help everybody out, leaders and officials who make life-altering decisions. We thank you for the many means and the people who can use these technologies to keep a scattered people somewhat connected, who use these technologies to help those who are in serious situations. Oh Lord, how sweet it will be when we can come together in joy and thanksgiving. I must admit this is something I've taken for granted these many years, but when we cannot do it, we realize how very wonderful it is to meet with God's people. Help us to trust you, even though we might have some fear and anxiety. I ask that you bless the hearing of your word as we continue to worship and honor you. How good you are, you are always good. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome. My name is Tim Breen, and I serve as the lead pastor here at the First Reformed Church in Orange City, and I'm thankful to be able to welcome all of you in here to our sanctuary 
on this afternoon for a time of study and community. Over the course of the last few weeks, we have been using our Vespers time to look at a few of the geographical locations that were important during the last days and hours of Jesus' life. Since today is Palm Sunday, I thought that I would share with you a little bit about the area that hosted Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that first day of Holy Week. Today, many of you have already heard a message about Jesus' victorious ride into Jerusalem. Now, that act itself and the acclamation of Jesus' kingship, the hosannas and the praises, those are the central features of the story. But I think that by kind of zooming out and taking a, a panoramic look at the topography and the history around that Palm Sunday staging ground, that we can have an even richer appreciation for Jesus' parade of praises on that day. So let's begin with what we already know. And that is that Jesus himself was not a resident of Jerusalem. Jesus was a Galilean. And although he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus was raised in Nazareth about five days journey north of the capital city. And Jesus spent most of his career ministering in the lakeside towns of Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin. At the same time, some of Jesus' most important events did take place in Jerusalem. And the authors of the gospel describe Jesus doing magnificent work there in the great city. So, so how do we explain that? Well, the answer, friends, has a lot to do with the Jewish commitment to celebrations in Jerusalem. On the Jewish calendar, there are three pilgrimage feasts or festivals that were to be celebrated in the holy city. The first of these festivals is called Pesach or Passover, and it was celebrated in accordance with the first full moon of the spring. Fifty days later, in early summer, was the second feast, the festival of Pentecost, which the Jews called Shavuot. And each fall, pilgrims journeyed to Jerusalem to celebrate the third ingathering called Sukkot, which is known to us as the, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Ingathering. And many people, not everybody, of course, but many people, including Jesus, left their homes around Palestine and gathered in Jerusalem for these festivals. They came there to worship in the temple, to fellowship with their brothers and sisters in the faith, and to make sacrifices to God. Now, as Jesus entered the city amid the palms and the cloaks and the hosannas, he arrived just as Jerusalem was gearing up for the first of those festivals for Passover. And the Gospels actually trace Jesus' movements before that. They follow him for most of the duration of his journey from his home in the north all the way down the Jordan River Valley through Jericho and up to the capital of Jerusalem. So the Palm Sunday parade then effectively was how Jesus crossed the finish line on this journey. It was the last stretch in that voyage, that journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. Jesus traveled that day, that last day, from the town of Bethany to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a distance of just under two miles. And on that final leg, Jesus crested and then descended a summit called the Mount of Olives. And it's this mount that we want to devote our attention to this afternoon. Now let's begin with a little bit of a clarification, because the name Mount of Olives is, in a couple respects, a misleading term. In point of fact, the Mount of Olives is not one majestic peak. 
it's actually a, a short mountain range. It's a strip of highlands about two miles in length. And this range is capped by three summits, the tallest of which is only about 800 meters in height. So we're hardly talking about Pikes Peak here. At the same time, the mountain does provide a sort of natural hedge of protection to the city of Jerusalem. It runs north and south in parallel to the city to the east of the capital. And this range geographically marks the end of the central highlands, which fan out westward, and marks the beginning of the Judean desert and the descent to the Dead Sea to the east. Now, the Mount of Olives was named for the plentiful olive groves that grew on the western side, the, the slope that faced Jerusalem in ancient times. It was a place of, of good food, a, a place to produce olive oil, and a place of beauty and of rest. We know, in fact, that during that fall festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, that the Mount of Olives served as a kind of campground for the pilgrims. And many people set up tents and booths there, and they built campfires, and they told stories as they looked across the valley toward the temple. Now today, of course, the Mount of Olives looks very different. Whereas in Jesus' time, there were a few buildings and many trees, today there are many buildings and few trees. Here's what the Mount of Olives looks like today. As you can see, the mount today is built up with facilities and roads. It hardly looks like a campground anymore. But again, we need to try to envision the mount as it was 2,000 years ago. And back then, there was lush vegetation. In fact, most of those trees survived until one generation after Jesus, when the Roman general Titus cleared them out to serve as building materials for his approaching army. And here's the other difference. In ancient times, there was a, a much deeper valley that separated the Mount of Olives from the Temple Mount in the city. Jerusalem, in fact, was guarded on two of its three sides, like two lengths of a downward pointing triangle, by these steep gulches. And between the Mount of Olives and the city was a valley called the Kidron. Over the last 20 centuries, these valleys have, have been filled in. They, they've leveled off now. But back in the time of Jesus, when he traveled from Bethany to the city, he would have descended a fairly perilous switchback road. And this street, in fact, was the first length in the road from Jerusalem to Jericho that we read about in the story of the Good Samaritan. Friends, the Bible talks on multiple occasions about the Mount of Olives. And I'd like to spend the rest of this discussion sharing with you some of those passages under two main headings. I'd like to think together about this special site as a mountain of grief and a mountain of glory. Mount of Olives is a mountain of grief and a mountain of glory. So how is the Mount of Olives a place of heartache and sadness? Well, let's go back to the very first biblical reference to the mountain. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, we read about a dark time in the life of Israel's greatest king, King David. And after a long and prosperous reign, David faced a painful and perilous challenge to his throne. And the usurper was David's own son, Prince Absalom. And Absalom became so popular with the people that he was actually able to seize political power. And David was forced to flee the palace and the capital city altogether. 2 Samuel chapter 15 says this, And then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. The whole countryside wept aloud as the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. 
But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. So the very first time the Mount of Olives appears in the Bible, it's as a place of mourning and gloom. The king has been defeated, and he leaves the city in shame and sadness. The son has driven out the father. Can you picture David climbing up that switchback with tears streaming down his face? It's an ascent, a a climb of discouragement and defeat. The king is has fallen. Now, those of you who remember this part of the Old Testament will recall that Absalom actually ultimately failed to seize the throne, and David returned and lived out his reign in Jerusalem. But the Mount of Olives would get another mention in the succeeding generation, because after David came King Solomon the grandest and richest of Israel's rulers. But in order to achieve his power, Solomon entered into a number of diplomatic marriages. He married foreign princesses in order to lock in peace treaties. And these wives, the Bible says, brought their foreign religious practices with them into Jerusalem. And at that point, Solomon's great wisdom failed him because he traded faithfulness to the true God for a different philosophy on life. What was that philosophy? Well, to put it bluntly, Solomon believed in happy wife, happy life. So he established an enormous shrine for all the images and altars to the false gods of his wives. Where did he set that up? Well, here's the story from 1 Kings chapter 11. As Solomon grew old, the Bible says, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. And the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So what was this hill east of Jerusalem? Well, you guessed it. It was a platform on the Mount of Olives. And it came to be called the Hill of Offense. I mean, just try to imagine in your mind's eye standing down in that Kidron Valley. On one side is the temple to the true God. On the other is a circus of shrines and high places for the satisfaction of Solomon's pagan wives. What a contrast. I mean, what a disaster. What a place of grief. The site of the father's weeping became the place of the son's wickedness. Let's come forward now to the life of Jesus because the Mount of Olives also becomes a place of sadness and of terror in his experience. And it was just four days after he heard those cries of Hosanna that Jesus knew the hour had come for him to be delivered over to his enemies to be crucified. Many of us will remember that minutes before his arrest, Jesus had been praying in a place called Gethsemane. 
But what most people don't know is that Gethsemane is itself a part of the Mount of Olives. In fact, Gethsemane means oil press and is generally understood to be the processing center for all of the olives that grew there on the slopes of that range. It was there in the place of the oil press that Jesus himself came under extraordinary pressure. He bore the crushing weight of sin on his shoulders and sweat like drops of blood, like an oil of grief poured out of him too. And all this happened on the Mount of Olives. At other times in ancient history, the Mount of Olives became kind of a scouting point or a launching point for invading sources who who aimed at conquering the city of Jerusalem, who aimed at destroying it. Think of Nebuchadnezzar back about 605 B.C. and then later came back in 586. We've mentioned the Romans about 70 A.D. These enemies, these armies looked across the Kidron Valley, from the Mount of Olives, they looked at Jerusalem, they sized it up to attack it. And if you were one of the people living in the city, seeing those armies amassing on the Mount of Olives would have been a sight of terror. It meant that your time was up, that the end was near. But friends, in God's grace and goodness, He is so often able to turn moments of horror and places of tragedy and heartache into things of beauty. And in the same way, the Mount of Olives is not just a staging grounds for agony and sin. It's also a place that has and will reveal God's power and love. I want to pull back for a minute to another modern shot of the Mount of Olives. As we've mentioned already, it has been almost entirely deforested. Well, what has replaced all that vegetation? The answer is graves. Because the Mount of Olives, especially the southern portion of that range, has become one of the world's largest cemeteries. At present, there are Around 150,000 people buried there. Some of these graves go back 3,000 years. But it's been in more recent centuries that so many people, mostly Jews, but a few Muslims and Christians too, have asked to be buried on the Mount. Why is this? Well, the answer, friends, points to God's glory. It points to a belief that when the Messiah returns to this world, he will come to Jerusalem from the east, from the Mount of Olives. And those who wish to be buried there hope to be the first witnesses up from their graves to see this miracle. This hopeful promise was first made through the prophet Zechariah, uh, just a generation or two after Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. The scriptures say this, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half moving south. And the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name. The Mount of Olives then will be the place of God's great victory. The venue where Nebuchadnezzar stood before taking the city will become the place where God would stand and become victorious for its residents, for the people of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 11, also written after Jerusalem had fallen, echoes this sentiment saying, Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols, and I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. 
I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. And then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. Now that mountain, of course, is the Mount of Olives, a place of grief and a place of glory. Now, it's probably not at all a coincidence that Jesus chose to teach his disciples about the great last acts of history from the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24 and 25 record his testimony about the return of the Messiah. Uh, It's the place where you read about the thief coming in the night and the wise virgins and the sheep and the goats. And Jesus taught these things from the slopes of the Mount of Olives. You see, Jesus knew that this would be ground zero for God's ultimate acts. But most importantly of all, for Christians like you and me, the Mount of Olives is the site of Jesus' ascension to heaven. There are a number of churches on the Mount that commemorate this moment. And this one, the the Chapel of the Ascension, is the best known of those built on the hill. But all these churches celebrate what's recorded in Acts chapter 1. There, the disciples watched as Jesus was taken up into heaven. Verses 9 through 12 say this, After Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Now, friends, it's not explicit in the text, but the assumption might be that when Jesus comes back, in the same way that he left, that he might also return to the same place where he left. Again, just one more reason that so many people want their final resting place to be there on the Mount of Olives, the place of God's glory. Now, as we close, let's come back to Palm Sunday. Because what's really amazing about the triumphal entry of Jesus is that it seems like The master is wrapping all of these realities into one experience as he rides the donkey toward the city. This would have been Jesus' view as he crossed the summit and descended toward the capital. Jesus would have seen the temple in the distance, a temple that he would replace in his own person. He might have seen Golgotha beyond the far walls of the city while perhaps other people were being crucified. Jesus would have heard the cries of the people, and this would have set his own heart to grief. A scripture says he wept at the sight of that great city. But Jesus was also acting to gather up and redeem the hopes of the nations, to restore everything that had gone wrong in the Mount of Olives. While Jesus had While David, rather, had been driven out in tears, Jesus entered in song. Where Absalom had staged a coup against his father, Jesus was submitting to the will of his father. Where Solomon had constructed altars to false gods, Jesus had come to be the sacrifice to save the worst of sinners. And in the same place that the enemy rulers stood to plot Jerusalem's destruction, Jesus stood to be her salvation. And the triumphal entry, friends, ultimately anticipates the return of the great king to the world, to resurrection and redemption. Because Revelation 7 verse 9 says that in the end, there will be another palm procession and that the Passover lamb will save the world forever. 
He will establish his name on the mountains and the earth will be filled with the glory of God. What begins on the Mount of Olives, Scripture says, will extend to the farthest seas. It will reach to the lowest valleys. It will span the broadest plains. And the Son of David, the true King of the world, will reign over all. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your triumphal entry and what it means for us that you were able to rescue and redeem the world from all that had gone wrong in the past. As we learn more about uh, this mount, this hill, this special place where the olives were pressed, we come to recognize again the extraordinary crushing weight of sin that you bore. And as we join with so many people around the world in anticipating the return of the great king, we look with our eyes heavenward like the disciples did and know that you will come back in the same way that you left. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our closing set of hymns will include Standing on the Promises, Lord, Our Lord, Your Glorious Name, and Day by Day. Standing on the Promises is number 306 if you have a hymnal. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with my Spirit's word, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening to, moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Number 319, Lord, our Lord, your glorious name, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Lord, our Lord, your glorious name, all your wondrous works proclaim in the heavens, radiant signs evermore. Your glory shines, how great your name. Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how great.
celebrate your name. Yours the name of matchless worth, excellent in all the earth. How great your name. Infant voices chant your praise, telling of your glorious ways. Weakest means work out your will, mighty enemies to still. How great your name, Lord, our Lord in all the earth. How great your name, yours the name of matchless worth, excellent in all the earth, how great your name. Who are we that we should share in your love and tender care, raised to an exalted height, crowned with honor in your sight, how great your name. Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how great your name. Yours the name of matchless worth, excellent in all the earth, how great your name. With dominion crowned we stand, o'er the creatures of your hand. All to us subjection yield, in the sea, the air, the field. How great your name, Lord, our Lord in all the earth. How great your name, yours the name of matchless worth, excellent in all the earth. How great your name. And our last one will be Day by Day, number 367. With each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he wants to bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he's laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meet him, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. 
I'm also going to sing one of these verses, the first verse in Norwegian. Blot and dog at oye blick om gangen, vilken tröst for min forsakte ån. Skulle da bekymring ta mig fangen, alltid viler i min faders hål. Han som har for mig en fader hjerte Av sitt rike forråd vil han gi Hver en dag den dels av fryd og smerte Hva jeg trenger av min Well, thank you again for joining us here for Vespers on Palm Sunday. I want to invite you to return and be with us via your electronic means, cable, or the internet this Thursday at 7 p.m. for our Monday Thursday worship time. We'll hope to see you then. Go in God's peace.